Sam, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for inviting us into your back garden. It looks pretty good. <laughs> it's a lovely back garden. I can't really <laughs> complain about it. I, I mean, I spend every day up here at the moment. Obviously, we're in the most unprecedented time at the moment with what's happened in the world. How have you dealt with it? Uh, I think uh, early on, I found it really hard. I think um, being stuck indoors for someone who likes to be out and about, obviously job day in, day out, playing hockey out on a pitch and yeah, being stuck indoors was, was pretty brutal, if I'm completely honest. Let's take you right back. Let's rewind to when you were a young boy. What was the dream growing up? I think any, any young boy's dream is to, to play for their country at sport, really. Well, I'd say most young boy's dreams are. And um, for me, actually, it was, it was actually I wanted to be a cricketer. Um, I, I wanted to play for cricket for England, really. Um, but I was actually better at hockey. And uh, that was kind of then, all of a sudden, the kind of Olympic dream kind of came on the radar. And that was something I aspired to probably from... I'd say probably from about the age seven or eight, I always haven't watched Olympic Games and stuff being like, yes, I want to go and do that one day and I want that to be me. As you say, you had this ambition to play cricket, but that didn't quite work out. At what stage did you realise that you had a real aptitude and a, and a connection with hockey? It's, it's a bit of a weird one. I kind of fell in love with the game, fell out of love with the game numerous times. Um, I actually didn't play hockey um, age 17, 18, I had a bit of a knee problem and I, well, I played a few local league mixed games for a very, very low level and I played local league football for a while and I really enjoyed that and it was probably an age in your life where, where you start having a few beers and you just kind of enjoyed life for what it was. It wasn't until the age of 18, 19 where, where I got a phone call to, to rejoin Beeston Hockey Club and say, come and give, us, give it a go again and, and I was playing for them in the second team and kind of got given a shot in the first team in the middle of that season and kind of that was that was kind of where it escalated from there over the next few years, but it still had its kind of ups and downs massively. What do you remember about the Olympics in 2016? What were your kind of memories of that? I think there's a there's a few different memories. There's the memory when you look at it with a very level head, and you go, you've been to an Olympic Games. It's what I dreamed of. It's a hell of an achievement, and a lot of people would would do a lot of things to do so but then obviously it's also tarnished on our success during it and and how it actually panned out for us there's also kind of a big cloud hanging over it that kind of moving forward you want to rectify and if you go somewhere where you're ranked four in the world and you don't make it out the group stage so theoretically are ranked well based around nine to twelve in in the tournament it's it's pretty upsetting and and that was the real tough pill to swallow you obviously get your opportunity to qualify for, for Tokyo 2020 but it's probably one day that will be with you for the rest of your life. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think celebrating in the back of an ambulance via FaceTime is probably not what I expected. And uh, I got a FaceTime call from, from George de Goli going, we've qualified for the Olympics, amazing. And I was like, yeah, it's amazing. So excited, brilliant. But yeah, I'm on the way to hospital with, with a very sore head and a very sore face. and and not obviously getting to, to have a couple of light refreshments when, when, the, when the time was right that night to kind of celebrate what, what would have been a great, great evening and obviously the success to be going to Tokyo 2020. I don't want to take you down a dark path, but can you remember the moments on the pitch and, and describe exactly what happened when obviously that shot came towards goal and, and hit you in the face? It was the weirdest moment where I've watched it numerous, numerous times since, I mean, in the hundreds. Um, and yeah, the whole world slowed down. It was like, so basically a, a shot came in uh, from, from Phil. Um, keeper made a save, there was a rebound and I decided I was gonna try and get across the goal at that point. Um, and basically I just put myself in a, in, a, in a terrible position. The ball's dropped to Harry, he shot quickly. And, and obviously it's hit me, it's my own fault. I'm in a stupid area. Um, and that's obviously a bit of part of my game and the bravery I kind of carry that is why I've had some of the success I have in goal scoring. So it's not something I doubt, I was just made a bad judgment at the time. What's, what's going through your mind at this point where you've had this horrific injury, you've been stretched off the, the hockey pitch and your whole life and the whole dynamic of your life potentially could change? Well, I think it would took a fair few days to hit. I think obviously the initial, the initial blow, I trotted off, I sat inside. Um, 
the performance director had made it into into the medical room already, I think, because they knew that they couldn't really leave me on my own, but the doc had got to go and liaise with ambulance crew and things like that to try and get me out of there as quick as possible. Uh, I remember sitting next to him, and, and it's a weird one, you remember things, I remember him putting his hand like next to my knee and being like, you'll, you'll be okay? And I was like, what do you mean? So I trotted off and thought, I'll have a look in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, wow. There was like, the swelling had come in some strange places. So I've got swelling here and like the ball indent in the side of my head. So it was like the swelling had come out down here, but massive. And then obviously there was nothing like, like bone structure in here at all. Uh, so obviously my face, as I described, looked a bit like this. And I was just like, wow doesn't look great does he? it was like no just sit down and I then jokingly was like can I go back on uh, he looked at me and said no and had to reason with me because I was not really in a state of reasoning with anyone being like look you've done your bit you've done this we're going to Olympics now like can we just sort you out um, so that was kind of that um, I took a light stroll across to um, to the ambulance I could I could walk and everything so that was all good and I hadn't been knocked out so trotted off I climbed in the back the door was open, we were waiting for the dock to climb in and my mum and dad stuck their head around the door to say hello. And I could just see my mum's face drop like, oh my word, what has happened to him? Still to this day, I talk to him about the car journey home. They're like, we drove for two and a quarter hours from Lee Valley back to, back to near Loughborough and not one of them said a word to the other one and just cried the whole way. Was there a point during that process and that rehabilitation and the hospital time that you had where you realised your biggest battle was going to be a mental battle. Obviously a lot of media attention around things at the time. And it was kind of not believing your own height that you were dreaming to come back and kind of accepting that you probably shouldn't or wouldn't, but then kind of just keeping a level head about it all. And I kind of accepted that I wouldn't play again, which then I feel helps me more than anything because then when I manage to now start to try and come back, that actually anything on top of that is a positive and, and kind of I'm blessed and whatnot to be able to do that instead of now being mortified if I didn't be able to fully come back and go to Olympic Games next year. How important was that mindset to divorce yourself of this dream that you'd had since you were a young boy to go to the Olympics and win a medal and suddenly it's been taken away from you but you've got to get that in your mind that actually that's okay because that's now not part of my life. Um, it was hard. I think I worked very closely with Katie Warren at the time, psychologist uh, who I use, and she just basically spoke to me about the fact that we've just got to kind of see, see the positive in everything. She taught me that you've got to accept how major what had happened was, and I don't think I actually did until probably lockdown. I've kind of realised the surgery was pretty hefty and all the things like that with it, and kind of what went what went on in that three month kind of whirlwind of my life where you had to deal with it, process it except you might not play again. And actually the tough bit was then trying to come back and get fit with no real end goal, because there's an end goal, but it was not necessarily possible. I came here on, um, I'll never forget it. It was on the Monday, I think about the 10th, 10th or 11th of January. And it was my day one of starting my six week return to play. And I got on the treadmill and I ran for two minutes and I got off and I went and sat in a stretching area. And I sat there and I went, why am I doing this? There is no reason. Like, I don't know if I'll play again. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to see the ball well enough or anything, so why am I doing it? And I think I sat there probably for about 10, 15 more minutes. And I was like, look, I just sat there talking to myself basically. It's like, that is not the spirit and that's not. And if I don't give it my best shot now, then, then I'll regret it in the future. Um, so I jumped back on the treadmill and I never really crossed that stage again, but it was just weird that it was like two minutes back into day one. But then after that, I just had a mindset that everything I achieved as we set small targets was a bonus. And actually, by trying to go to Tokyo 2020, which it's still named even though it's next year, it's um, just, it's, it's, it's all a bonus. And I don't have the pressure of selection and everything because I'm trying to achieve something we didn't expect. So it kind of, I think, is going to make me hopefully a better hockey player because I'm not carrying the worries because what I'm trying to achieve is something we never expected to. You've been really outspoken about your mental health and you've used the phrase, it's okay to not be okay quite often. How important is that? And how important do you actually tell yourself that, that phrase? I think it's massive. I think it's one of those things and uh, it's a weird one. Um, I think a lot of people, 
there's a lot of things go on with mental health and especially with males a lot of people think they can't talk about it because it's, it's not manly or whatever and and personally I don't see an issue with it and now I'd talk about it anytime and and I've got there's sometimes some days if, if you do struggle before I'd, I'd hide in a room and not say a word whereas now if I jump out of bed which which can be hard at times for people to do but pick up the phone and, and ring a friend and I've got a couple of friends that I ring and they don't know they're chatting to me to make me feel better about everything mm. but actually I just need a chat to someone about something and not necessarily about mental health or anything but that little conversation and a small conversation and almost probably sometimes it's just feeling a bit loved isn't it that actually you having those conversations without realizing means a lot to me and helps me a lot and I think the more I've learned about it is the fact of just talking to people makes you feel a lot better about it all. When you're upset about something, actually reflect of how important it really is because often, often we're very lucky. And I, I spoke to, to the boys at hockey um, just after I'd come back and we had a little chat about the fact that the amount of times I go into Bisham on a daily basis and I go, do I want to be here today? Like, come on. Like, that has changed my attitude to that is, I nearly had that dream taken away from me. So therefore now I have a completely different outlook on day in, day out when I walk onto that pitch that actually you, you do have to treat it like it could be the last because it may be.